Okay, thank you. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Reto Knutin and, and Eric Fischer, who contributed to this work. Um, I would like to open this presentation showing you this figure taken by a paper by Dan Retal. We actually saw uh, already a similar figure, I think, on Monday during another talk, so I'll try to be relatively quick on this one. Um, what the authors did in this work was analyzing a 40-member initial condition ensemble obtained by running CCSN3 under the A1B forcing scenario. And what they showed uh, was that internal variability can have a substantial effect on the definition of future trends of both temperature and precipitation. So here we are looking at temperatures. And then on the top left panel, you can see um, the mean winter temperature trends, well, the mean winter temperature change, actually, in the period 2005-2060, as computed by averaging across the 40 runs. This uh, can be, of course, regarded as our best estimate of the force response of temperatures. But as soon as we look at individual realizations of the model, we see that they can be uh, very different. On the two panels below, we can see the warmest and the coolest among the runs. On the right-hand side um, panel, we see um, different mean winter temperature anomaly time series as computed from the warmest and the coolest among the runs in red and blue, respectively, over three theaters uh, corresponding to three different grid points at different latitudes. And you can see, we can actually see the different effect of internal variability at different latitudes. And by aggregating temperature data over the United States and the whole globe. So when it comes to uh, the global mean temperature, we see that uh, internal variability doesn't really have, doesn't really play much of a role in defining future trends. Uh, but even if we look at a pretty huge region like that of U the United States, we see that internal variability can actually um, enhance uh, the future uh, change in temperature or almost completely hide it. So uh, the key point here is that uh, different realizations of the very same climate can be very different. And this has to be taken into account also when comparing model simulations with observations. So how can we better compare models and measurements? One of the possible answers uh, could be offered by dynamical adjustment. Dynamical adjustment is a tool is a method which allows to remove the component of variability of a certain quantity of interest throughout this presentation, it's going to be temperature, that is attributable to atmospheric circulation. So it consists of three steps, uh, which I'm going to describe very quickly. As a first step, we need to uh, sample in, um, internal variability of atmospheric circulation, and this is typically performed by uh, applying uh, an empirical orthogonal function analysis on certain fields. In this case, we are computing the two leading empirical orthogonal functions on a monthly winter uh, 500 hectopascal g potential height over the, this Euro Atlantic domain. As a second step, we can regress the associated principal components upon the values of temperatures, the time series of temperatures, grid point by grid point, then basically compute the mean effect of these modes of circulation and temperatures. And as a third step, we can dynamically adjust our measurements, our fields, uh, by applying this formula. Where TDA here are the dynamically adjusted temperatures, which are computed by removing from the original temperatures the contribution of the first and modes of circulation, which are um, computed by um, multiplying the regression maps by their associated principal components. So this method can be applied to a pretty huge um, number of scales, both special, special scales and temporal scales. Um, as a first case study, I would like to show you this temperature time series. This is the mean winter, well, this is the time series of mean winter temperature anomalies as computed over Switzerland in the period 1960-2015. Um, uh, what's striking is the pretty strong cooling that Swiss, um, Switzerland has been undergoing since 1988, amount, amounting to approximately minus 0.037 degrees per decade, and in contrast with the 0.25 uh, warming in the period 1960-2015. Um, so what we can do is um, sampling circulation over the very same domain I was showing you in the, in the previous slide, and uh, estimating the effect of each mode of, on, on this very time series, on these data. 
and we end up with this uh, new time series uh, in, shown in red, which of course has uh, features wiggling of smaller amplitude, that's almost by definition as we are removing part of the, of, of the variability of the signal, but in particular is characterized by this warming trend of 0.27 degrees per decade, uh, pretty much in line with the 0.25 uh, measured in the period 60 to 15. As a further step, we can compare this observed temperature trend with the very same quantity as simulated in the SIMIC 5 ensemble. So uh, this is the observed value and the histogram uh, of the mean winter uh, temperature trends in the period 88 to 15 as simulated by 40 SIMIC 5 models. And although we see that there are some models actually showing a cooling uh, the SIMIP5 mean and the observed value are pretty much far apart. And this uh, discrepancy can be accounted for uh, looking, well, removing the contribution of, of temperature to, um, to temperature related to atmospheric circulation. Um, and this is, of course, the dynamically adjusted uh, value of the measure temperature trend. So we can apply the very same method, actually a very similar version of the method over the European domain. These are, on the left you see the 1988-2012 mean winter temperature trends in, over Europe as estimated by the Berkeley data set. Uh, we show, well, the, the map shows basically cooling everywhere with um, an average value of minus 0.42 de degrees per decade. And after accounting for circulation, we end up with this new map with an average value of 0.44. I was saying a similar method because in this case we actually estimated uh, the modes of circulation by performing an empirical orthogonal functional analysis on sea level pressure fields, but still pretty much the same. And again, we can compare uh, the, the original and the dynamically adjusted value of the, well, the mean trend over the region with the very same, with the, with the the distribution of the very same quantity as simulated by the SIMIT-5 ensemble, well, by 40 members. And, he, and also in this case, we see that we can somehow reconcile the discrepancy between the absurd value and the SIMIT-5 mean. So these results are, of course, sensitive to the number of modes we include in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, when dynamical adjusting, but still they are, well, not very much sensitive. So... Um, what else? Yeah, as a further step, we applied this dynamical adjustment method to uh, test to what extent um, the, observed atmosphere, the observed boreal winter cooling over land masses in the period 1998-2012 could be explained in terms of atmospheric circulation. So the idea originally came from what was highlighted by Cohen and co-authors in a paper published in 2012 in which they showed that the global warming hiatus, as, as, at least as estimated in this period, 1998-2012, uh, was basically an asymmetric phenomenon. Uh, so characterized by a very strong cooling in the northern hemisphere winter, especially over land masses, while uh, in contrast, more or less significant warming trends could be measured, detected uh, elsewhere and in other seasons. So I think those two panels pretty much make the point. These, were, these are the mean, annual mean and DJF mean temperature trends estimated from era interim in the period 1998-2012. And we see that much of the cooling comes from, the, uh, well, from North America and, and Eurasia, especially over Eurasia. So what we did was applying, well, was sampling atmospheric circulation from sea level pressure variability. Um, in the domain 20, 90 degrees north. And uh, we, we, we saw that um, atmospheric circulation could, in fact, explain much of the observed cooling in boreal winter. Uh, so these are the temperature trends from the from era interim analysis in winter. Um, in, in the top panel, we see the original trends. And in the bottom panel, the dynamically adjusted trends. What we also noticed, actually, was that atmospheric circulation couldn't really explain the whole hiatus. Uh, explaining by, by saying explaining the hiatus, I mean, I just mean reconcile the uh, seasonal and annual temperature trends in, in, in this period, 1998-2012, with the long-term 
trends. Um, and an additional factor we found uh, to play a quite an important role um, is coverage bias, basically meaning missing observations. Um, so what we did was testing the effect of coverage bias as represented in the hat 4 um, data set on the estimation of temperature trends, on the seasonal and annual temperature trends in the hiatus period computed from five different reanalysis data sets. So this was actually done in a pretty simple way. Um, what we did was simply, so here you see the January 2012 temperature anomalies in hat 4 and in IRA interim. What we did uh, very simply was reinterpolating the reanalysis data set to the uh, hat 4 resolution uh, and masking out on a monthly basis the um, all the grid points corresponding to missing observations in, the, in, in our measurements. So simulating the coverage bias in reanalysis. And we saw that this actually played a very important role in the estimation of the hiatus across all the five reanalysis. So we saw a very similar response of the five data sets to this little trick. Um, in particular, the, the, the effect of coverage bias um, was, related, was found to be related to uh, the undersampling of the Arctic region, which would have led to an underestimation of the effect of Arctic amplification um, on the temperature trends in this period. So uh, before concluding, I just would like to ask this question. To what extent is atmospheric circulation affected by anthropogenic forcing? This is, of course, um, a question which is of great interest by itself but it also represents a caveat when, it come, caveat when it comes to applying the dynamical adjustment method I just described. Uh, this is simply for the, the, the reason that if atmospheric circulation is affected by anthropogenic forcing, as we remove circulation, we, we remove part of the force response of the system. Uh, we, this is actually pretty much work in progress. We have been performing a number of analyses um, both working on, well, working on several data sets and especially on the CIMIT-5 ensemble. What we found is very in short that all the results I've been showing you so far are not affected by this, this issue, but that this um, issue might actually become a problem when applying this dynamical adjustment method in the future, in future simulations. So what we found analyzing the CIMIT-5 ensemble was basically a weak but statistically significant response of atmospheric circulation um, to anthropogenic forcing. In the second half of the 21st century and under the RCP 8.5 forcing scenario, so we're pushing it hard. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, I, I, I hope I could show that um, dynamical adjust, this dynamical adjustment method could serve as a pretty useful tool for the estimation of the anthropogenic contribution to past trends, and it could also serve the purpose of a better comparison between models and observations. Um, furthermore, we could show using dynamical adjustment that accounting for both atmospheric circulation and the effect of coverage bias, as sampled from hat 4 allows to reconcile the hiatus seasonal and annual temperature trends to their long-term counterparts. So thank you for your attention.